All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's take our Bibles, if we could, and open them to uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 4. The title of our message this morning is Praying Within God's Will. Wouldn't you like to learn how to do that? Pray within His will? A lot of times we pray, we don't know if we're being heard because we don't know if we're really in the will of God. And yet this prayer that Daniel prays here in chapter 9 gives us the principles by which we can know that when we do pray, we are within God's will. I want to thank uh, Gabe Morris for filling in last week. Appreciate that. Trust you enjoyed his ministry. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, we are uh, in the book of Daniel. The message of the book of Daniel is really about the times of the Gentiles. Uh, When these words were written in the 6th century, the nation of Israel, the southern kingdom in particular, the tribe of Judah was in a very difficult place. Uh, Having been removed from their homeland about 350 miles to the east to a place called Babylon. Uh, It's something that had happened to Israel despite 800 years. Prior to that, they were resting comfortably in their own land, going all the way back to the time of Joshua. But now something has happened. The nation of Israel, through the disciplinary hand of God, has been removed from their land, they are in Babylonian captivity, and so what is the plan of God, what is the program of God, what is the will of God during this difficult time? Well, we wouldn't know had God not raised up the prophet Daniel. Daniel basically is raised up to give prophecies that would occur in history in advance that would occur during this difficult time period. Daniel is actually held out for us as an ethical role model. Someone to imitate and emulate when you're living outside your comfort zone. How do you live for God, you know, when you're a Christian and your professor is not? How do you live for God on a college campus when you're a Christian and the majority of people you you find yourself around are not Christians? How do you Live for God uh, if you're one of the few Christian members of your family and the rest of them think you're uh, a little bit crazy. I just got back from visiting my family, so (laughs) some of these adjectives are on my mind. But you know, it's so easy to feel all alone, to feel vulnerable, and yet that's how the nation of Israel felt during this time. So Daniel is a role model. He's showing us to consecrate yourself to God, live for God, don't compromise, and leave the results of your life to Him. Chapter 1, as we have worked our way through it, is basically an introduction to the book. It explains the captivity. It explains Daniel being taken into captivity as a mere teenager. Chapters 2 through 7 we've worked through is organized in a particular literary structure that we've talked about in depth. You might be assisted by pictures. Uh, That's one way to remember the contents of the book of Daniel. Associate a picture, a key picture, with each theme of the chapter. We've looked through all of these different pictures, haven't we? And finally, we got to chapters 8 through 12, which is really a shift in the book. Chapters 2 through 7 was a message to the Jews and the surrounding nations. Chapters 8 through 12, the language shifts from Aramaic back to Hebrew. And so chapters 8 through 12 is understood as basically a message aimed specifically at the chosen people, the nation of Israel. It's highly 
prophetic. We've worked our way through chapter 8, the vision of the ram and the goat. And the last time we were together and I was with you, we found ourselves in chapter 9, which is the famous prophecy of the 70 weeks. Sadly, most people are so eager to rush to the 70 weeks prophecy that they skip everything else in the chapter, which is a a tragic thing because in chapter 9, prior to the deliverance of the 70 weeks prophecy, is one of the greatest prayers in the entire Bible. In fact, uh, I'm convinced that if we were to isolate some principles of prayer from this chapter and apply them to our prayer life, we would be astonished at the intensity and gravity and effectiveness of our prayer life. Prayer is something that is vital to the growth of the Christian. The expectation of God to his children is that we would be people of prayer. And yet, how do you pray exactly? Do we follow just a rote formula? No. Jesus condemns that practice in Matthew 6. But he does say that there are principles to follow. And Daniel 9 is one of those chapters that gives us tremendous principles of prayer. We have studied, have we not, the setting, chapters 9, verses 1 and 2. We saw the historical setting. Daniel begins to pray as the Persian Empire is now in power, the empire that overthrew Babylon. Daniel uh, begins to pray this prayer about 538 B.C. That date becomes very significant because it's so obvious that Daniel is walking by faith in his prayer. He's praying about the temple. The temple, as I'll be showing you, wasn't standing at this time. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed it probably, let's see, I wrote the exact years down, probably about 48 years earlier, and it wouldn't be rebuilt for another 23 years. So Daniel is in Babylon praying about a temple that didn't exist. So obviously this is a man who took God at his word and walked by faith, and the promises of God, regardless of what was happening in the physical and the material world all around him. This date of 538 B.C. would essentially mean Daniel is in his early 80s at this time. So he is a man who has walked with the Lord in crisis as a teenager. He is a man who has walked with the Lord in crisis as a middle-aged person. He is a man who is continuing to walk with the Lord in crisis into his 80s. And we see in this book the full biographical sketch of Daniel. We don't just get a snapshot of him. We see his whole life. And it really shows us what a walk with God consistently throughout one's life, throughout the seasons of one's life, actually looks like. We have seen verse 2, the prophetic setting. Daniel apparently had been studying his Bible. He had been studying the prophet Jeremiah. I gave you the exact verses Daniel had likely been looking at. Jeremiah had prophesied just a little earlier. Uh, Before the captivity, most of his prophecies anyway, took place before the captivity took place. And because Daniel was a student of Jeremiah, he knew exactly how long the captivity would last. Because that detail is only given in Jeremiah's writings. He knew that the captivity would last 70 years. And so Daniel could do the math. He could understand that they had been taken into captivity at a certain time, about 605 B.C. The 70-year captivity was about to elapse. There was only three years or two years, roughly, left on the prophetic calendar. He doesn't know what the future is immediately for the nation of Israel, but he begins to petition God. He begins to seek God because he understood the times, the signs of the times. He understood the signs of the times because he was a student of the prophetic scripture. 
Most Christians today have virtually no idea what time it is on God's calendar. They just live from problem to problem. They don't understand the general season that we're in. And the reason for that is they don't study the prophetic passages of Scripture. Or perhaps they're in a church environment where the pastor won't talk about and equip them concerning prophetic passages. Daniel was not like that. He was aware of prophecy. And consequently, he was aware what time it was on God's calendar. And he knew exactly what to pray, when to pray, and how to pray because of his awareness of the prophecies given to the prophet Jeremiah. So consequently, verses 3 through 19, after we move out of the setting, Daniel starts to pray. Now, I am convinced that this prayer will make no sense to you unless you understand the covenant that God has made to the nation of Israel. Daniel, all the way through this prayer, is praying covenant language. He's praying about things that God articulated to the nation of Israel all the way back in the time of Abraham, 2000 BC. And he's also praying things that God articulated through Moses, given roughly 800 years earlier. It was his knowledge of this covenantal structure that shapes Daniel's prayer life. The principle to take from that is this, the better you understand the Bible, the better you understand the revealed word of God as given in the Bible, the better you know how to pray. You know, the book of James, as we'll be talking about today, talks about asking for things amiss. You know, we we petition God for things that are outside of his will, which God is not obligated to honor. And the reason we do that is we don't have an awareness of God's plan and program for history. We haven't really given a lot of attention or time to the revealed word of God as given in these 66 books, and so we really don't know how to pray. Daniel is not like that at all. Daniel, when he prays, is almost giving a Bible study, if you will, on the covenant. Of course, the Abrahamic covenant is the foundational covenant that God gave to the nation of Israel. God, in Genesis 15, unconditionally promised to the nation of Israel three things, land, seed, and blessing. And those three provisions are developed elsewhere in more detail in the Scripture. So the nation of Israel has and continues to be the owner of, of those three things. But then God does something else about six centuries later during the time of Moses. He takes the nation of Israel out of Egypt. He takes them to a place called Mount Sinai. And beginning in Exodus 19, he begins to articulate to the nation of Israel a completely different covenant called the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant is very different than the covenant that God gave to Abraham, which is unconditional and unilateral. When God begins to articulate the Mosaic Covenant, he says, Now then, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my possession among all the peoples. He goes on and says, Then you will be a kingdom of priests, and so forth. And so it seems somewhat confusing that the Abrahamic covenant is no strings attached. But then all of a sudden you get to the Mosaic covenant and strings are attached. So which is it? Well, the easiest uh, conceptual tool that I can think of to explain these covenants is the difference between ownership and possession. Ownership means the blessings, land, seed, and blessing are forever yours. But whether you possess or enjoy your promises is a different matter. To enjoy those promises, you have to comply with the Mosaic Covenant. This is God's program for Israel. I could own a beach house in the Hamptons. I don't, by the way. I wish I did. 
but I'm so busy working, I can't really enter into the house and possess or enjoy what it is I own. See that? The nation of Israel, because of the Abrahamic covenant, is the owner forever of land, seed, and blessing. But whether a generation enters into those blessings is contingent upon their response, not to the Abrahamic covenant, but to the covenant that God made to Moses at Mount Sinai called the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant, if you want a fancy name for it, it's what you call a suzerain vassal treaty. That's a fancy name, I know, but it was a common form of treaty in the time of Moses where the suzerain, the superior, promised to the vassal or the inferior, if you obey the covenant text, then there are going to be lots and lots of blessings. If you disobey the covenant text, there's going to be lots and lots of what? Curses. And so if you look at Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14, for example, you're going to see articulated by Moses, blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. And as the nation was rejecting the Mosaic Covenant, God was not severing the nation of Israel forever. After all, for God to do that, he would have to violate what he promised in the Abrahamic Covenant, going back to 2000 B.C. But as the nation of Israel went into disobedience, it deprived that generation of the blessings which they could have had. It doesn't cut Israel off forever, but it deprives any given generation of the blessings they could have had and, in fact, promised them various curses. Daniel understood this whole structure. And that's how he understood why the nation of Israel had gone into deportation. In fact, when you go back and you look at Deuteronomy 28, just for a minute, Deuteronomy 28, given 800 years earlier, through Moses, God is very clear as to what would happen to the nation when she persisted in disobedience. Deuteronomy 28, and notice, if you will, verses 49 and 50. These curses are somewhat scary. They kind of roll up like a snowball. And finally, something would happen. Verse 49 of Deuteronomy 28 says, The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who will show no favor to the young, excuse me, no favor to the old, nor show favor to the young. Go over to Deuteronomy 28, look at, if you will, at verse 64. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. God said through Moses, look, here's what's going to happen when you dishonor the Mosaic Covenant and you move into idolatry. I will not cut you off as a nation, but I will send you into discipline. It's sort of like our own walk with the Lord in the church age. Did you know that once saved, always saved? We've taught very aggressively the doctrine of eternal security. We've spent 58 lessons going through that. Isn't that enough lessons to get the doctrine down? That's a lot of lessons. And if we've tried to communicate anything, it's this idea that you're saved by grace and kept by God's grace. Nothing can take away your salvation if you have trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. But let me tell you something. You step out of line as a Christian, whom the Lord loves, the Lord what? Chastens. And sometimes the chastening of God can feel so severe that you feel almost as if as God has cut you off. But God can't cut you off because of the doctrine of eternal security. Once saved, always saved. It's the exact same in the covenantal program with Israel. Nothing can sever Israel. Thank you, Abrahamic covenant. 
However, the Mosaic Covenant is very clear that the nation can go through extreme discipline, which has been well testified throughout their history. I would, I would even argue that they're even under severe discipline even as I speak. And even though they're going under discipline and are in discipline, God will never cut off the nation of Israel. And this is the whole backdrop, this is the whole background, if you will, to Daniel's prayer. God was very clear. You continue on in rebellion against my covenant, and boy, did they do that, let me tell you. It got so bad that they were even offering their own children, just prior to the deportation, into a fire to satisfy a pagan god named Molech. You can't get much worse than that, can you? And so God did exactly what he said. I'm going to bring a nation from afar. You're going to be scattered. You're going to be taken into deportation. The prophet Jeremiah is very clear exactly how long the deportation is going to last. 70 years. We gave you the background of that 70-year number and why that's significant. The last time we were together... And so Daniel understands what time it is. He understands that God can't cut off the nation of Israel because of the Abrahamic covenant. He also knows that the nation has gone through extreme discipline and that time of discipline is about to end. He is aware of all of that because of what Jeremiah said. And Jeremiah and Daniel are both looking at what God promised 800 years later through Moses in the Mosaic covenant at Mount Sinai. That's the whole backdrop for this prayer. You can't understand Daniel's prayer unless you understand that background. Daniel was effective in prayer because of his grasp and belief in the revealed will of God as given in the, the covenants that I've briefly gone over. So the prayer can be divided into three parts, confession of sin, verses 3 through 10, acknowledgement of judgment, verses 11 through 14, request for divine mercy, verses 15 through 19. Notice how Daniel begins with the confession of sin. What he's saying here is, God, we got what we deserved. Because we're in deportation, exactly like you told us you would put us into deportation, if we disobeyed the covenant text. Verse 3, if I remember correctly, we covered last time, so we pick it up at verse 4, Daniel 9. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps His covenant and loving kindness for those who love Him and keep his commandments. You'll notice that Daniel begins this prayer with a confession of sin. He doesn't charge into the throne room of grace, you know, demanding his rights. He basically acknowledges that, God, you told us this would happen. If we disobeyed, lo and behold, it has happened, and we are sorry. In fact, you'll notice that he makes two references here to the word covenant. At least one reference. Who keeps his covenant. What covenant is he talking about? He's talking about, number one, the Abrahamic covenant. But more importantly, the covenant which got them into the mess that they're now in. The Mosaic covenant. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14 says this about the Christian's prayer life. This is the confidence which we have before him if we ask anything according to his will. He hears us. God has no obligation to answer prayer requests that are outside of his will. In fact, you wouldn't want God to answer prayer requests that are outside of his will. God, make me the richest man in the world. Well, God says, I don't think I'm going to answer that one because I know what that wealth would do to your ego and pride. So I'll keep you, you know, in a different socioeconomic bracket than Bill Gates, for example. 
And you can pray and pray and pray all you want, and God's hand is not moved at all because you're asking for something that he never promised that is outside of his will. So praise God that he doesn't answer prayer requests that are outside of his will. You wouldn't want that. As much as we throw tantrums and so forth, give me this, give me that. I mean, when we're raising our children or our grandchildren and they demand to eat ice cream sandwiches, three, three square meals a day of ice cream sandwiches, I mean, does any sane parent grant that request? No, because you know what an intake of ice cream sandwiches for a week straight will do to a person. My wife says, you know, you're going to end up looking like your father if you, if you do that. Because <laughs> I love ice cream sandwiches. So a parent doesn't grant, you know, any type of petition or request. Well, God is the same way. He doesn't just grant things just because we ask and demand and so forth. So Daniel understands the will of God because he understands the word of God, because he understands the covenantal structure of God, and consequently he knows exactly how to pray. He begins with a confession of sin. We got what we deserved. And he begins to shape his prayer according to what God has revealed in the covenant structure. Take a look here at verse 5 as he continues to pray. We, that's a very important pronoun there, first person plural. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from his commandments and ordinances. What commandments and ordinances? The commandments and the ordinances that God gave to who? To Moses, 800 years later. I am fascinated by this pronoun, we. Charles Ryrie in the Ryrie Study Bible, at the notes at the bottom, says this, Daniel associated himself with the sins of his people 32 times. In fact, this prayer is not terribly long. It goes from verse 3 to verse 19, and yet Daniel uses the first person plural pronoun we 32 times. I look at Daniel's life, I don't really see a lot of sin in it, do you? I mean, it seems to me like the guy, at least the excerpts were given of his life, is walking with God, growing in God, being victorious in God, and yet here Daniel is identifying with the sins of his people with such solidarity that he doesn't say they sinned, they brought it on themselves, they got what's coming to them. He says we. Let me ask you a question. In your personal prayer life, is there more we in your prayers or more they or them? Look at your people, God. Look at those Christians. Look at them. Look at how they act. Forgetting the fact that we are part of a body, the body of Christ. Just as Daniel recognized that he was part of a nation. You know, in pastoral ministry, you get a lot of people and they'll come to you and say, say this, man, I wish so-and-so were here today. They needed to hear that. And my thought process is always, well, what did you need to hear out of the sermon? And even as the preacher, there are things God corrects me on. What, what do I need to hear? And I think a lot of times it's all them, they, those, that. Look at how they are acting. What about we, us, I? And you see this in Daniel. You see this this, uh, solidarity with his own people. We have rebelled against your commandments and your ordinances. In other words, what he's saying is we're getting exactly what we deserve because we've rebelled against your Mosaic Covenant articulated 800 years earlier. Notice, if you will, verse 6. Moreover, we, see the repetition, have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and all the people of the land. What is this business here about prophets? 
I mean, what is a prophet exactly? Probably the, the tightest definition I could give you of a prophet is this. Someone who is interested in covenant enforcement. That's who prophets were. The prophets showed up during times of rebellion, and there were many times like that in the life of the nation. During times when the kings were going against the covenant, the priests were going against the covenant, the people were going against the covenant, the, the prophet shows up and says, you know what, you guys keep doing this, you're going to keep being cursed. If you go back to the covenant, Jeremiah, the way he articulates it, he says, search for the ancient paths. Go back to the beginning. Go back to Sinai. Go back to the revelation of God. Go back to what God said he would do in terms of blessings and cursings. Go back to that and walk in obedience to it. And you'll see the hand of God not in terms of blessing, not in terms of cursing, rather, but blessing. The, co- the prophets filed what are called covenant lawsuits. The book of Hosea, chapter 4 and verse 1, says this, Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case <clears throat> against the inhabitants of the land. Because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. Hosea says, I'm filing a case. The fancy Hebrew word for this is reeb. It essentially means a covenant lawsuit. The prophet would show up and says, you know what, wayward Israel, wayward kings, wayward people, wayward priests. Here's the problem. Here's why your crops don't produce. Here's why you keep going more heavily into debt. Uh, Here's why you keep fighting wars and losing. Here's why the Assyrians are on the horizon, and after them the Babylonians are on the horizon, and after them the Romans are on the horizon, because you're violating God's covenant. What was that covenant all about? Deuteronomy 28, blessings and cursings. You want to be blessed? Obey the covenant. You want to be cursed? Keep on going the path you're going. And it's going to culminate in your own deportation and your own captivity. Now, how were these prophets received? Let me tell you something. If you were actually called of God as a prophet during this time period, not only did you have a short career, you had a very short lifespan. Because the people did not want to hear about their own disobedience. 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 16 summarized it, summarizes it all. Just prior to the deportation, it says, But they continually, notice that word continually, mocked the messengers of God, despised his truth, scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people and there was no remedy. You go far enough in your rejection of prophetic voices that the captivity and the deportation can no longer be averted. Jesus in Matthew 23 verses 34 and 35 summarized Old Testament prophets. He says, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all of the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. It was normal for the prophets to be persecuted because nobody wants to hear about the fact that they're in the problems that they're in because of their own choices. You can't blame it on something else. The prophet would say, blame it on yourself. Look in the mirror. And that message just doesn't go over well then. doesn't go over well today, does it? 
far more popular preacher would be someone that promises you immediate wealth and prosperity. That's the church you max out in terms of attendance. That's how you get popular. You don't go around talking about sin and come back out of sin. So consequences can be, for sinful choices, can be averted. But the reality of the situation is the prophet was there for the good of the people. And yet the people didn't understand that, didn't accept that. Quoting that great uh, theologian Jack Nicholson. You can't handle the truth. Every time I, I, I hear that line, you can't handle the truth, I think of the Bible. The prophets are there to help. You go to a doctor, you don't want the doctor to tell you what you want to hear necessarily, do you? you? The doctor is there to tell you what you need to hear. Now, we understand that in the area of medicine. We understand that in the area of law. We understand that in the area of financial planning. Why don't we understand that in the area of spiritual things? Uniformly throughout history, the voices of the prophets are rejected. I believe today that there are prophetic voices. Now, don't get mad at me for saying that. What I mean by prophets today is I'm talking about preachers. People that are trying to direct the population of the United States of America back to God's truth. I believe God raises up people like that. And yet, how are they treated? Fundamentalist, narrow-minded, bigoted, Let's pass some kind of hate speech laws, law to get their voices off social media, off the internet, off radio, off television. What is going on? People don't want to hear, just like in this day, the voices of the prophets. Yet God sends them out of love. What prophetic voices are you rejecting as a Christian? What people has God put in your path to help you, whether publicly or privately? And yet, you just don't want to hear what that person has to say, so you drown them out. You change the subject. If you're honest with yourself and you're honest with your walk with the Lord, God sends you prophets and He sends me prophets all of the time. But many times we don't recognize them for the good that they could help us with because we don't like the message. The message is it's your fault. You can't blame your parents. You can't use the abuse excuse. I'm not denying the fact that people come from very, very difficult backgrounds today, but the bottom line is at some point you started making choices. And you're in the predicament you're in largely because of your own habits and sinful choices. The popular prophetic voices blame that on someone else. An accurate prophetic voice is look in the mirror. Look at yourself. That's why prophets weren't uh, well accepted in their day any more than they're accepted well in our day. And in fact, when a prophetic voice is stifled, sinful humanity rejoices. Did you know that? The book of Revelation Chapter 11 and verse 10 talks about two prophets in the tribulation period. And it talks about them being murdered in the city streets of Jerusalem. And it talks about the whole world watching this happen. It says in Revelation 11 and verse 10, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice and celebrate. They will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. The prophets today are rejected. The prophets of ancient biblical history are rejected. The prophets of the tribulation period will be rejected. I, I don't know what you think about the late uh, Jerry Falwell. 
I realize that you mention a name like that and you could have a mixed response. There's things you like, there's things you don't like. But I'll tell you something. I felt that he was a prophet of God. I don't agree with every little detail of his theology, all of his tactics, but he stood up at a time of national confusion and called the United States back to God. That's what a prophet does. Well, how how was he rewarded for that? Well, he was painted in an incestuous relationship in an outhouse with his own mother and sold by one of those, sold, you know, all over the world, this picture of him, uh, through one of those uh, pornographic magazines. Well, I don't know if I need to give you the exact magazine. Um, And I remember very specifically when Jerry Falwell died. There was an interview that came on with Christopher Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens was uh, a well-known atheist. Christopher Hitchens has since died. But I remember Christopher Hitchens being jubilant, jubilant over the death of Jerry Falwell. And immediately my mind went to Revelation 11 and verse 10, which says, On earth they will rejoice over them and celebrate. They will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. I re- even remember the interviewer interviewing Hitchens, the interviewer, not even a saved person, saying, well, shouldn't you, uh, before you express jubilation, shouldn't you at least give the family time to mourn? I mean, isn't everybody, even if you disagree with them, entitled to a decent burial? And I remember Christopher Hitchens directly saying, no, this man was a demagogue, this man was a bigot, this man was narrow-minded. And he started listing the sins of Jerry Falwell. And as he was listing the sins of Jerry Falwell, he said this, Jerry Falwell taught that Christians are going to be raptured to heaven before the tribulation period. Well, that's what I teach. That's what you believe. I, I, I didn't realize we have gotten so far in our rebellion against God that teaching the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture means you can rejoice at a man's death. You know, God help us to understand this. And this is what Daniel is praying concerning these prophetic voices. Moreover, we. Daniel doesn't say they. He says we. Have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name, to our kings and our princes and our fathers and all the people of the land. You know, God is so long-suffering. Do do you realize how long Noah preached before the flood hit? Genesis 6 verse 3 says 120 years. That's a long time. That's half the length of the duration, roughly, of the United States of America. And let me tell you something about that crowd. That was the most God-hating crowd probably ever been assembled in the history of humanity, that pre-flood generation. And here is the patience of God. The long-suffering of God through prophetic voice of Noah. Look at, look at our country. Look at the millions and millions of babies that have been killed in the womb through abortion. I understand when I say something like that, there are people that have been involved in abortions. I'm not trying to heap guilt on anybody. The grace of God is always available for any sin. But look at how this has just gone on and on. And on. Look at how the scripture has been totally thrown out of the public square. Where really what gets everybody's attention today is someone has the outrage to post the Ten Commandments on a schoolhouse wall. Oh, that'll get the dander up of folks. 
That'll bring the lawsuits. Here they come. That's what everybody's worried about. Look at how we've treated God. And look at how God keeps showing our nation grace. After grace, after grace, sending prophetic voice after prophetic voice. And how we need to start praying the way Daniel prayed here in Daniel 9. We have not listened to prophetic voices. It takes some humility to acknowledge that, doesn't it? Verse 7, righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame. As it is this day to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel who are nearby and those who are far away in all countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Unlike you, God, whose character is perfect, we have royally messed everything up. You can look for holiness in heaven, Daniel says, but you're not going to find it here amongst me and my people. When was the last time you prayed that way? Rather than a self-centered demanding this and that from God. Look at the humility in this prayer. Verses 8 and 9. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord. To our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Notice the repetition of we. And unlike the perfect character of God which cannot sin, we as your chosen people are in gross sin. And we are getting exactly what you said we would get. Verse 10, he brings up the prophets again. Nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings which he set up before through his servants the what? The prophets. God gave the law. That was an act of grace. Then God gave the prophets to remind the people of the law which was an act of grace. And then God gave them another prophet. And another prophet, even after they had mistreated all the previous prophets. Is that not the long-suffering of God and the grace of God? But you see, the problem is we think that because we're basking in the grace of God, the grace of God is unlimited. You reach a point where your sin and rebellion is outside of God's reach where God actually gives people over, the end of the book of Romans talks all about it, over to what they want to do. It's an expression that appears about three times in Romans 1, 18, through verse 32. It's, it's one of the most frightening expressions I know of in the scripture, where it says, God gave them over. And I wonder, with all of the blessings that we've had in this country, all of the spiritual light that we've had in this country, the various prophetic voices that we've had in this country, I'm wondering where we are on this continuum. I'm wondering, are we at a point where God just says, okay, do what you want. I'm not going to bother you anymore. May God help us understand this. May this type of thinking shape the way we pray and seek God and petition God. Verses 11 through 14, you have Daniel acknowledging divine judgment. Notice, if you will, verse 11. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse, look at that word, you should underline that word curse. So the curse has been poured out on us 
along with the oath which was written in the law of what? Moses. Daniel is not talking about the latest uh, trendy teacher that had appeared on the scene, and there were a lot of them. He's, he's going back to the ancient past. He's going back to Sinai. Jeremiah chapter 6, seek the ancient path. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the root. Go back to the foundation. That's why around 4th of July, I love doing sermons on American history. And most Christians have never heard information like this before. That the root of the United States of America is to honor God and propagate his gospel. It's not a matter of personal opinion. It's the Mayflower Compact, which predates the Constitution and predates the Declaration of Independence. The Mayflower Compact is the beginning of everything. And how we need to get back to those principles. And yet we're so busy and so uh, deluded that we don't even have the capacity in some cases to even think in a clear way about the past. Daniel is all about the past. Verse 12, thus he has continued or has confirmed his words which he has spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great calamity from under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like which has been done to jerusalem verse 13 as it is written in the law of moses all of the calamity has come upon us we have not sought the favor of the lord our god by turning away from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth Therefore the Lord has kept calamity in store and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done and we have not obeyed your voice. How could we expect God to do anything different than honor his word? How could we expect God to do anything different other than honor the Mosaic Covenant? That is God's nature. And when we live in flagrant violation to that covenantal structure, we have brought the whole thing upon ourselves. It is very interesting to me where he says, we have not given attention to your truth. You know what the complaint of today of the average Christian in the United States of America, the preacher preaches too long. He commits the unpardonable sin by taking the service beyond 12 o'clock. In our case, a good half hour beyond 12 o'clock. The appetite for the things of God, the appetite for the Word of God, is almost something that it's an endangered species. And yet, this is the very problem that got the nation of Israel into this mess. They would not give attention to divine truth. And consequently, they were unaware of this calamity that had come upon them. They should have been aware, aware of the whole thing. Moses spelled out 800 years in advance exactly what would happen. Deuteronomy 28 Verses 15 through 68 spells it out as clear as it can be spelled out. If you want a parallel passage, Leviticus 26, verses 14 through 46. When was the last time you sat down and read those two chapters together? You read Leviticus 26, beginning to end, and then you read Deuteronomy 28 from beginning to end. Do you know how much information you would grasp concerning the plight of Israel and why God worked in the Old Testament times and today works the same way? Just by understanding those chapters? It is amazing the light that will come into our minds when we give attention to the basics or to the fundamentals. This prayer is all about the law of Moses. This prayer is all about the curse. 
What curse? Deuteronomy 28 is the curse. Leviticus 26 is the curse. Yes, there are some articulated blessings at the beginning of both chapters, but the majority of those chapters deal with the curse. This prayer is all about disobedience. And why we're getting what we deserved. He confesses sin. He acknowledges, verses 11 through 14, that we're getting exactly what God said we would get. And then, fortunately, aren't you glad the prayer doesn't end there? Verses 15 through 19 is the request for mercy. God, help. Help us. We don't deserve it, but be gracious to us one more time. Verse 15. You know, O Lord, our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as it is this day. We have sinned. We have acted wickedly. Now he's not going back just to Mount Sinai. He's going back to before Mount Sinai. He is reminding God, in a certain sense, of God's own faithfulness. You're the God that took us out of Egypt after 400 years of bondage. Exodus 2.24 says this, So God heard their groaning, and God remembered His what? Covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why the captivity... And the release from Egyptian bondage happened because of the covenant of God. And now Daniel is saying, God, one more time. Not on the basis of any merit we have, but on the basis of your grace. When you pray, do you think about the faithfulness of God? Do you remember the times when everything was stacked against you? You had nobody to help you but God. And what did God do in your life? He showed up. Isn't that interesting that God shows up when nobody else will? And what does God want us to do in those times? He wants us to remember those times. This is where the discipline of journaling or writing in a diary or taking a photograph, or whatever the case may be, is so helpful because in your crisis you can remember what God did. You can remember how He helped you. You can remember how He blessed you. The details are foggy, then you see it in written form, you see the date, and you say, wow, you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is He not? And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if God helped me out of grace way back then, what would stop him from helping me now? And this is what Daniel is doing. This is the value of of history. Skipping down to verse 18, he says, and don't worry, we'll be doing verses 15, 16, and 17, but not today. Verse 18, Oh my God, Incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes. See your desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplication before you on account of any merits on our own. Wow. But on accord with your great compassion. What, what, a, what a principle that is, verse 18. Approaching God, not on the basis of any merit we have, but on the basis of His provision of grace. For Israel's outworkings, it was the covenant. Daniel didn't say, hey God, I'm a prophet, you're obligated to listen to me. And after all, I'm in the process of writing one of your books. He totally approaches God on the basis of the provision God had made for Daniel. That's how we're to pray. We don't go charging into the throne room of grace on the basis that somehow, you know, God, after all, I am the pastor of Sugarland Bible Church. 
and I did get some degrees at Dallas Seminary. So here's what I have to say. That's not how we pray. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 18 and 19 says, Therefore, brethren, verses 19 and 20, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. How do you enter the throne room of God? His blood. How do you enter into the Holy of Holies via prayer? Through his veil, which is his flesh. Well, what if there was no shed? Bloodshed. What if his body didn't suffer on our behalf? You have no basis to approach God. Neither would I. And when we pray, we need to acknowledge this. We're not standing here because we somehow deserve it, because of denominational affiliation or loyalty or whatever. We're there because God has granted us provision to go into his presence. This is all over Daniel's prayer. And yet so many times we have become so accustomed to the grace of God, and thank the Lord for all of it, the mercy of God, that somehow we think God is obligated to hear us, forgetting the fact that we wouldn't have any standing before God had it not been for His grace. And by the way, have you noticed what he's praying here for? Verse 16, he's praying for Jerusalem. He mentions the word Jerusalem twice. Verse 17, and by the way, Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed Jerusalem. Verse 17, he's praying for the sanctuary or the temple, which Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. Verse 19, he's praying for the people of Israel that are in captivity. I don't see a lot of me, me, my, my, me, me, my type prayers. I see a lot of praying the priorities of God. He's praying the things that are on God's heart. He's praying the things that are on God's mind. What is God concerned about? Jerusalem, the sanctuary or the temple, and the people of Israel. What is Daniel praying about? The priorities of God. It's it's so convicting to read this and to compare my prayer life to this. So many times, uh, you know, I'm not praying about my lost neighbor that's on their way to hell that God loves so much that he sent his son to die for. I'm praying for comfort. I'm praying for ease. I'm praying for something uh, narcissistic. And so many times our prayer lives do not reflect divine priorities. And one of the things that's so interesting about this to me is Daniel prays for Jerusalem, verse 16, The temple, verse 17. The people of Israel, verse 19. And how does this prayer get answered? The 70 weeks prophecy. Delivered by the angel Gabriel, verses 20 through 23. You have the 70 weeks prophecy, verses 24 through 27. Do you know what that prophecy is about? Just take a wild guess. Number one, the city of Jerusalem. Number two, the temple. Number three, the people of Israel. In fact, when you start praying divine priorities, that's when you start getting answers to prayer. In fact, what it says here, we haven't gotten to it yet, it says, while I was praying, at the beginning of my prayer, an angel showed up and answered those three Priorities. Listen, you start praying the priorities of God and you start seeing rapid answers to prayer. You pray outside the will of God. You pray for things that are fleshly, selfish. The book of James says you ask amiss. It, it is it's just amazing to me how this sixth century prayer functions as such a light to our prayers, telling us exactly how to pray. And may God help us understand this. You could be here today and you've never actually entered into the provision of God. 
you don't understand your access to God. Your access to God is based on what we call the gospel. We call it the gospel because it is good news. We call it good news because Jesus did all the work through his sacrificial death and his bodily resurrection from the dead. He did everything to bridge the gap between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. He came into the world to live a life in my place I couldn't live. He came into this world to die a death on a cross for my sins, which I could never pay. That's called gospel, good news. And then he says to lost humanity, do you want this gospel? And we say to God, what do I have to do? God says, what do you have to do? I did everything. There's nothing for you to do other than receive it as a free gift. You receive a free gift from God by trusting or believing in what he has promised. That is the single condition which unites a sinful human being to a holy God. And the Spirit of God has come into the world to convict the world of their need to do this. That's what the Spirit does. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so no doubt, no doubt, one of the things that's happening right now as I'm speaking is people are under conviction. How do I know that? Because that's what the Spirit does. That's His job description. And if you find yourself under conviction then our exhortation to you here at Sugarland Bible Church is to respond to the convicting ministry of Jesus Christ by trusting in his provision. Trust is another word for belief. You receive what he has done. It's not necessary for you to walk an aisle to do it, join a church to do it, give money to do it. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord where he places you under conviction and you respond to that the best you know how. And if the Spirit of God is convicting, then please understand that today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. The best you know how, respond to what Jesus has done. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord. If it's something that you want more information on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we are grateful for this ancient prayer, how it corrects many times the shallowness of our own prayer lives, but your word, Father, just doesn't correct us, it's, it moves us in the right direction. Make us people of prayer this week as we seek to implement the guidelines of prayer that you've so f accurately and faithfully given us here in Daniel chapter 9. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said.